Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. You know, a couple of videos ago, I did a video on an extremely small brass flanged hex nut with an 080 thread through the center of it. I mean, this thing was so small you could sit it on the tip of your finger. If you watched it, thank you very much. If you haven't, go check it out. Now, I made that six-sided nut in a spin indexer. Spin indexer is the 5C holder that gives you 361 degree incremental options, provided it's an even number, right? 360 degrees, one at a time. Anything in between, you're pretty much out of luck. Now, shortly thereafter, another YouTuber demonstrated three other ways to do this using uh, dividing head, indexing plates, rotary table. So, between the two of us, we covered four of the five possible ways that it can be done. Now, if you're following this channel, you know that I'm making a scale cannon. Actually, I'm making two cannons. One is an artillery gun with the large spoke wheels, and the other one is a deck gun that you'll find on a pirate ship. Small, hand size. But the spoked wheel, the correct spoke wheel on a field artillery gun has 14 spokes. 25.714 degrees between the spokes. Now I got to think to myself when I did the research on this, how did these cannon builders do this back in the day? And if you're a subscriber to a channel called Engels Coachworks, I believe, what a craftsman this guy is. He works in wood, he does big wheels and stuff, amazing. I started watching his stuff and it came up with a few ideas, but today I'm going to do a scale wheel, a setup wheel. This isn't actually the real one, so I'm not going to make it out of brass. I'll make the spokes out of brass for contrast, but it's an aluminum and brass spoke, 14 spoke wheel. And I'm going to do it with nothing more than a calculator, I mean, and a milling machine and some reamers, of course. But if you have a calculator and math skills, you don't need an indexer, you don't need a rotary table, you don't need a dividing head. You can just get the job done with the material on the shelf. So let's take a walk out to the shop, hit the lathe first, make the blank, move over to the mill, and I'll show you how to put 14 holes in, 25.714 degrees apart, without a dividing hand. Let's take a walk. Okay, let's prep the wheel blank. Whenever I do a job like this, I always deburr one side of the blank that I'm going to use. When I stick it in the chuck, move the blank around. Roll it around in your hands until it finds a seat. If the saw cut isn't true, you don't want any hard stops in the original operations. When it stops clicking and moving, you are probably pretty close to where you want to be. Alright, I like it. The extension of the jaw is pretty far out, yes it is, but I do have my safety mark on it. And this blank is thicker, or thinner, excuse me, than the step on these jaws, so reversing the jaws is not an option. Let's face it off. Anytime you have your jaws extended like this, take the machine out of gear and give it a little spin. Make sure everything clears. Everything. We're good. Sleeves up.
Well, for all you guys out there that are thinking, what's up? These are standoffs that are going to establish the parallelism of the second side. Now, if you think you can set up soft jaws and make soft jaws quicker than that, I dare you. Okay, I've taken a piece of half inch aluminum, just a little bit bigger than the diameter of the part, and seat clamped or can't twist clamped, these are great little clamps, the part to that blank. I turned a tracking diameter on here so that I can indicate this. We're going to stick it in the vise, sit on a pair of parallels. Get the idea. Can't do it while I'm holding it, but. We're going to close it up and we have a stable base that we can drill. And since I have a CAD system in my office, I went in and I laid out a 14 hole pattern. So I now have the coordinates to drill 14 holes in this at the 27 or 25.7 degrees that I had on the screen inside. So that's the next step. Set this up in here, tram it, drill 14 holes. Let's get it done. Okay, through the magic of accelerated video, I'm going to pop a 251 diameter hole in the center of this and 14 equally spaced holes on a 2 inch bolt circle. Okay guys, note to self here. If your head is not perfectly trammed to your table and it's at any kind of a projected angle, actually greatly exaggerated here, but lowering the table or raising the table, you can lose your concentricity or the location to your part. So if you go considerable on your on your elevation, reindicate the part for accuracy. Fourteen holes. Let's drill them. Ream them. That actually wasn't too bad. I plan to drill and ream each one of these holes on location without having to go through fourteen moves again. I did that so that it was a visual indicator that I'm in the right spot. Okay, through the magic of accelerated video, we now have 14 evenly spaced holes on this part. I would like to share something with you that I've been doing for a long time that has saved me a lot of mental anguish, I guess. And you can relax a little bit when you do a job like this. On an even number of holes, chances are the pattern in the quadrants 
are identical. And you can see that in this case this is true. These holes are exactly the same length from the center as these holes and they're also the same distance off center. So in order to drill four of these holes relatively quickly you only need to remember two numbers. This coordinate here and then jump the exact same amount across and then when it comes time to jump over here well it's already set so you know what the number is run it to zero and replicate it and then exactly same thing here. You can do that with these holes can do it with these holes. It's very easy to do and you can also do it with these holes. These holes here would be the radius of the bolt circle because they're on center. It makes it a lot easier to do just a square pattern as opposed to remember or try to locate 14 different locations as you go around. Just remember the two numbers that define that hole. It's the same two numbers here, it's the same two numbers here, it's the same two numbers here. Then you just pick a different set of numbers. Drill this one. These coordinates are the same as these, just positives and negatives. It's very easy to bounce around a multi-hole pattern using that technique. Alright, let me show you what that's for. So now you have a plate with 14 holes in it. 14 holes that are evenly spaced. You want to translate this bolt pattern to the outside of the part. Now you have several options here. If you want to transfer the holes in line with the existing hole, that is not a problem. We know that the angle relationship between all of these holes is exactly the same. I'm sure you can just see it falling right out of there now. If you want it right in line with one of the holes, let's just say one, two, one, two, boom. Now by using holes on either side of that hole, you can find that hole quite easily and guarantee you're going to come down right in the center of it. I will put a pin in here in the machine and I will indicate either side of that pin to get my zero and I will bump the outside of this up against the stop. Now you can use one hole on either side, you can use two, you can use three, whatever, it depends. But you can see that it forms a right angle to the center of that hole. If you wanted to split the difference, well, you could do that too. As you can see. Let's say you want to split the difference. Also quite possible. Surprisingly enough, as soon as I can find my other pin, right before my very eyes it disappeared. Aha! There you go. The space is where the previous hole was. We used the, we used the hole as the index point prior. Now we use the space as the index point. Space, one, two, three space one two three put you in between them so it's up to you how you, however you decide to do it now there is a reason I'm doing it this way and that'll become apparent at the end of the video but I'm going to use probably whatever hole pattern allows me to clear my vice depth and if it doesn't allow me to clear it cleanly I will use a parallel as such I'll show you the first couple of holes first couple of setups and then I'll run around it off camera and we can get back and take a look at it. Show you what the next stop is after that. Here we go. This is the setup that I'll be using. I am going two holes off of either one. Planning on having the drilled hole in line with the index hole. And when you tram a pin like this, it is not all that difficult. You just want to come down and Find the high spot on the pin by raising and lowering your quill and then gentle rotation back and forth to make sure that you have a high spot. And I don't know if you can see that. The camera angle is pretty tough with the swing at 180 degrees, but we are about 10 
on the other side of the indicator where the word says sharp on the dial. So let's spin it around, see what we have on this side. Okay, 10 as well. Now, naturally, I set this off camera just to give you the mechanics behind this setup. But that's how you tram a pin to find the center of a hole if you want something drilled from the OD to intersect a facial feature. Now by simply using an edge finder against one of the surfaces here I can center up the drill for the next operation and I will just repeat this pattern 14 times around the outside. I'm not going to bore you with that, maybe for the first couple of holes but not for all of them. Okay, in order to index this thing 14 times correctly we need to have three holes between the pins at all times. If there's more than that they better be symmetrical about the hole that's in the center. Aligning it with the center hole is going to make it easier visually, but that's what I'm going to do. I will index this thing 14 times, keeping three holes between the two outrigger pins at all times. It is sitting up on a parallel on the back so that the bottom clears the base of the vise, and there's a hard stop set on the other side. That is my awesome edge technology uh, material table stopper over there. Love it. All right, let's pop a couple of holes in it and get it, uh, get it going. I am indexing each one of those drive pins one hole to the left of the position that it was just previously sitting at. Down against the parallel, push against the stops. Here we go. the spacing between the holes scare you. It's a larger diameter, greater projection, it will be farther apart. This particular reamer, I've used this before. This is a right hand cut, right hand spiral flute pattern on this, designed to draw chips up from the bottom of a bottomed hole. Okay, as promised, 14 holes in the face, 14 matching intersecting holes around the perimeter. Now we're going to go back to the lathe to finish this. But that's not the next step. Next step is making the hub. Let's do it. Okay, we got inch and a quarter material. I need a piece inch and a quarter long. No specific reason. I just think that's a good ratio. Machine is out of gear. Stops are still in place. I'm going to measure from the part that's inside the machine to the outside. Cut it off at about 1 inch 300 long. I like it. 
60-61, inch and a quarter, let's do 570 RPM. Quick spin, make sure everything's good. We're good. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's drill and read the same 251 hole through the center of this. You know, here's a, something a little bit out of sequence. Actually, perfect sequence, but not what you're expecting. I'm gonna leave the hub right where it is for now. Use it as an armor. Okay, now here's a little twist that I'm sure you didn't expect. Let's stick the 251 pin in there, and we're going to put the wheel on, like right now. Oh. And let's pressure turn the OD of this thing. Clean it up. Nice light cuts, not a problem. I'm gonna switch over to a high speed tool. I just like high speed better on them. Watch the difference in the finish. I would say that's considerably better. Scotch break, take it out. And of course, the whole thing's got to come out. Alright, knowing that this is just a test piece, I'm not going to get crazy. Everything here is cosmetic. Go for about an inch and a quarter long, about a 450 center raised rib with a reduced hub on either side, just strictly for appearance. Let's face it off, take a measure.
at 72 more coming off. Okay, quick little machining tip here. I need to take 72 thousandths more off the face of this piece right here. If I face across, chances of me rolling the burr into the bore and creating a larger burr in the bore than on the outer edge of this part is greatly increased. So I'll probably go about 65 all the way across and then drop the tool into my 72 and pull it out. That should give me a nice clean hole. If you can see the hole now, it's pretty ratty and that's only from a 15 thou pass. So a 72 would all but close that hole up. Let's see what happens. Cosmetic work on either side. I want a 450 hub in the middle. 470 hub in the middle. Let's stick it out and just get grand here. If you find yourself in a situation where you need to choke up on a small shoulder, which is what's going to happen here, I'm going to put the pin back in the part. And put the pin in a drill chuck. See. And turn the machine on, the pin should run relatively true. Let's take a look. Close enough for what I'm doing. Alright, let's do the hub on the other side. Okay, next step on the particular wheel is to knock the center out of it. We don't need the center section because it's going to be a spoke wheel, so we're going to knock the middle out. I moved over to soft jaws for this operation so I can have as much surface contact on the outside and not compromise the finish or distort it because it's going to get pretty thin. And let's see how we're going to knock the middle out of that. We're going to tree pan the middle out of that. Like a deep facial o-ring groove. With any kind of luck, this tool is going to work. It's a nice wide tool, so I'm going to go with around 235 RPM. And I'm not going to leave too much of that rim left. Let's 
So let's see what you have. Uh, Too much pressure. As soon as it gets to those holes, that's going to be an intermittent release of that pressure, and the chance of it grabbing is pretty good. I'm going to change the rake on the top of this and put a little bit better surface on the front. Should be night and day difference when I come back. Okay, I put a mild top rake on that, sharpen both sides, and let's see if that chip flows out of there a little bit better. Anytime you're pushing on a tool like that, it's a recipe for disaster. If you got to push too hard, something's wrong. Back off and figure it out. You'll notice as the part spins, you can see a difference in the color at the bottom of the groove. That would indicate that something is flexing. The tool's flexing, the material's pushing away or grabbing. With the correct grind on the tool, the finish at the bottom of the slot is much cleaner, which is good. The continuous chip and you can feel it as you're driving the hand wheel that it's a nice smooth continuous pressure on this now the chip will be a ribbon until you encounter the cross holes and then the chip is going to start to sh shatter not chatter and come off in little short segments You can feel it, and you can hear it, and you can see it. There they go. The tool has just made contact through to the holes. I'm going to go 50-50 on this. And that's a good way to do it. I can tell that I'm well into the holes. Let's stop and take a look. There you go. Okay, let's flip the part around. Pay attention to the numbers that I uh, just recorded going for the depth on that side. Get back to this other side and we will go partially through this, not completely. And just like a bandsaw cut, you can hear the material start to wind down. And if you don't feel like eating this puck when it comes out of there or jams up and snaps off the tool and ruins the part, Listen for that sound to get to the tinfoil stage, and we're going to back off and stop at that point. You can feel pretty confident in this operation until the chip is no longer a ribbon. Then you know that you're midway into the hole. Yeah, you can see I'm just starting to break through. Feel the face of the material to look for any kind of a flex. And when you can detect any movement whatsoever, you are probably to the point where a good shock will knock this puck out, and that is the plan. I know that the grip on the soft jaws is superficial, and that the puck being formed in the center will pass through the jaws without encountering any obstacles. So you can see the chips are real small like they were on the first side. And I had to go to voiceover on this because the screaming that's going on right now was just absolutely just distorting the sound of this camera. And let's search for a soft faced mallet and see if we can coax this piece to shear off. A couple of blows in the right spot. Once you got one edge that starts to crack, stay on that edge and just walk the crack around. There you go. Now that's a lot safer to do. But beware that you now have a, a little saw blade on the inside of this part. And any indiscretion on your part, you get out of shape for just a second. And these things are going to remind you who's boss. Take a light boring pass to knock them out. Stand to the side because these things are going to hang up in their jaws and come out like little razor blades. And if you're more comfortable doing it at a slower RPM so you can control that flight, then by all means have at it. And the chip on the boring bar does the exact same thing. It's continuous until it gets to the holes. 
I am now boring into the soft jaw to assure that the bore that I've just created goes all the way across the face. Any radius on your boring bar when you hit the soft jaw is going to be a ridge on the back of your part. So go beyond to make sure that that doesn't happen. Now you can rest assured that when this was a solid block, there was a lot more pressure on the OD of this part. With the center being punched out like that, the jaw pressure distorted this ring. So it's actually no longer round as is. I'm going to put a little 100 thou deep tracking diameter on the front of this. And we're going to reduce some of the jaw pressure. And watch for a difference in the cut. You'll be able to see some high spots, some low spot, maybe one low spot. But you will see a difference in how this tool tracks. Let's adjust the jaw pressure just a hair. If your chuck isn't nice and smooth, get it to be nice and smooth. Because during an operation like this, you don't want to be fighting the resistance in the chuck. You want all the feedback to the chuck key coming directly from that part and not from grime built up in your scroll. Put it back in gear. And just look for... Okay, if you've got really good eyes, you can see that it's now an intermittent... And you can see the difference in the two parts. See the line coming around? Halfway. There's a perfect example right there. Some cut, some not. And that's the kind of thing where you have your plug gauge that fits your part perfectly in the machine. And then you take it out, put it on the bench, and come back from lunch and put the plug gauge, uh, try it again, and it doesn't fit. And you think, oh, well, maybe the you know, grew or something while I was eating my lunch. No, it changed as soon as you opened that chuck. It was no longer flat. If you needed something this thin to be super flat, uh, a six jaw would be a better idea. Or strapping it down with face clamps and not putting any pressure on the OD at all would certainly be your best option. Keep the pressure away from the critical feature. Go perpendicular to it. You can never go wrong. Let's finish up the bore, put a couple champers on this thing, and take it over to the bench. Okay guys, that's all the time I have for today. I can't uh, shoot the machining of the hub, but I really hope that you come back and see how that's going to be drilled. These will all be sized off. The thing will be balanced, centered, everything will be cleaned up. But it looks like a ship's wheel now, doesn't it? That's beautiful. I'm kind of happy with the way that looks. That's kind of nice. Anyway, 14 spokes without an indexer. I hope that you like the way that was done, and I hope that you remember it. But come back for the machining of the hub. You are going to like how that's going to be done. And it's going to be, uh, it's, it's going to surprise you. Come on back for that. Anyway, that's it. I'm going to be off the grid for a little bit. So if I don't post the video, don't hold that against me. I will be back. There you go. 14 spokes, no indexer. Who needs an indexer, right? No indexer, no rotary table, no dividing head, no special nothing. Boom. Done. Thanks for watching, guys. As always, Joe Pye Advanced Innovations. I'm out.